Well, good morning. Good morning. It is a great pleasure for me to be here. I am so excited about being back. Thank you for inviting me back. Thank you for, for just your willingness to, to have me to be back with my family. And what a great, great uh, opportunity this is. Choir, good job. Good job, choir. I tell you, the choir, I'm, I'm impressed. The choir has, uh, has grown, and it has gotten better since I've left. And, and well, of course, that, that is to say because the MC's not in it. So uh, that's good. So, so that, I'm sure that was a big improvement right there. But, uh, but uh, 125 years. Well, that's a great accomplishment, isn't it? 125 years. That's a lot to be be proud of, and, I, and I'm proud for you. And, and uh, so, so, um, so, Roy Pat, what was it like 125 years ago? What was that, what was that like when the first time, when you first met? So, we're good. We're good. <laughs> we're good. Well, let, let, me, uh, let me just sort of reminisce with you just a little bit. I know some of you younger folks and some of you folks that haven't been here is uh, very long and, and maybe uh, uh, have come more recently. Let me sort of reminisce with you just a little bit some things that, that I, I remember, you know, I remember, um, I remember when, when there was no air conditioning, there's no air conditioning, and I remember, the, I remember there were, there were, there were fans that were situated, remember those fans, and those fans would, uh, there was a couple of fans that would sort of oscillate back in the congregation, and there was, there were two that was stationed right on the, on the, on the, on the speaker, and what I didn't realize at the point, at that point, was that when, whenever I'd get real hot in those fans, I'd lose my voice. And so I kept losing my voice, you know, during the summer. But I remember, I've still got a Bible, I've still got a Bible at home, and I look at it every once in a while at a particular spot. But I remember in July, I remember preaching, it'd be so hot, and sweat would just drip off my nose. <laughs> And, uh, and, and there's a spot in my Bible where I can open it up, and it's crinkled because I can take it to the passage. It was in 1 Samuel, and, uh, and, and right there, and it was just, it was just soaking wet because I, I, was, uh, I was sweating so much. But, but, uh, but I remember the fans. I remember the nowhere. I remember when we had dinner on the grounds. We had dinner on the grounds. We had it out here under the, under the trees out here. Remember that? And, uh, and so I remember, remember those days. And, uh, and when I, it, during the time that I was here, I remember I re, uh, Karen and Lynn, I married, I think, married Lynn and Karen, and uh, uh, now Davis and Melody, I think they were my first, and uh, now Bob and Stella, I think you, did, didn't you get married while I was here? Did you, didn't you? I, I'm, 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 I'm just wondering. I, I'm, okay, okay, but I, but, but I was thinking it was, I was thinking, but I remember, I, I remember, I remember Earl, Earl had, I mean, um, um, Ronnie, you had just had you just had your accident, Ronnie. I think just a couple of weeks before I came. Because as a matter of fact, I remember visiting you at Duke Hospital before I even came. And uh, and I remember I remember the uh, the pastor search committee. I remember meeting meeting the good folks there. And and uh, and and after that, I remember driving up. I drove up, and uh, and this is before I'd even come, be even been invited to preach. But after I had met with committee, and the church doesn't really know this, but I came, I, I drove up, and, uh, and this is the days that, uh, that you didn't lock the doors, and so I came in the door. I came in that, I came in that door and, uh, and walked in here and stood behind this pulpit, this very pulpit, and stood behind this pulpit, and that was before even I came to preach for the very first time for this church. And um, so, so there's just a lot, there's a lot of memories that I have, and, uh, and I'm just, I'm just, I, and I really feel that, that my life is so much richer today because of the influence of this church in my life and in my ministry. And, and I, I, I talk with pastors who have started out with bad experiences, and it really put a, it really put a, um, it, it just put a bar on their ministry for the rest, and it, it was very difficult for them to sort of overcome that. But I tell you, and I'm not exaggerating this, when I came here, I knew very, very little theology. I knew very little of the Bible. I mean, I didn't know the difference between Job and Job. You know what I'm saying? Huh? I mean, I thought you read the book of Job just to get find a job somewhere. You know, that's what I thought the book of Job was. And, uh, and uh, I didn't know the difference between John, John the Apostle. I didn't even know what Apostle was and John the Baptist. 
You know, so I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I knew very, very little Bible when I came. I was in seminary, but, but, but this church took a risk and called me, and, and it really enriched my life. And, and I, I just can't tell you how much it, it has meant to me uh, through the years. You know, uh, you know I, I've, I've had, I've, the Lord has blessed my life and blessed my family and blessed my ministry. But I think, I really believe that this church, uh, whatever value, whatever I've been able to accomplish in my ministry, I think this church really has, uh, has a part of that and has played a great significant part of that. So, so thank you very, very much for all that, that you have done and for uh, your willingness to, to, uh, to take in a young family and to love them and to love on them and to, and, and to allow them to make mistakes and, and to not... Uh, and to not crucify them when they've made the mistakes, but to allow them to, to, to do that. Um, so, uh, now when we came here, my oldest daughter was just a few months old. Uh, she presently lives with her husband and two little girls. They live in Wilmington. Uh, and then my, my son was born at Morale Parham Hospital while we were here. And so he, he and his wife live in Florida and he, he's, a, he's a detective there in the, uh, in the sheriff's department there in uh, Flagler County, Florida. And, uh, and my youngest daughter, uh, she was born after we left here. And so she is with us today with her only son and my, our only grandson. And, and she and her husband live just right outside Charlotte. So I get to see them and the, and the little one quite a bit. So that's, that's a, little bit of a little bit of a breakdown of, uh, of my family. So... So thank you for letting me reminisce just a little bit. So I know some of you, some of you, some of you, uh, some of you uh, it, that meant really nothing to you. But, just, but thank you for letting me sort of get that off because it means a lot to me. And it means a lot that I could uh, sort of share that and, and to tell the church thank you for all that uh, what you've, you've meant to me and my family. Now, with that being said, would you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. I want, to read, I want to read a parable. A parable that is spoken by the Lord Jesus. But what I want to do is show you how that parable connects with, with what really lies before. You know, there is a term that's used in business. It refers to the final assessment of a business deal. It, it, it's the bottom line. It's the, it's the profit loss or gain margin it's it's what you have left over at the at the end of a business transaction it's what is left over it's what either it's going to cost you or what you're going to get out of it and it's a term that's re, that we often refer to in life it's called the bottom line you ever heard that you know what's the bottom line and when you and we speak of that in culture so what's the bottom line so what's in it for me all right so so all right what do i have to pay or what do I get out of it? What's the bottom line? Well, well what, we're going to, what, what I have understood, that that, that understanding, that, that, or that conversation of what's, what's the bottom line, that's a, that's a question that Peter asked the Lord Jesus in chapter 19. And it's what he asked in chapter 19 that prompts what Jesus says now in chapter 20. So what's the bottom line? Jesus is going to give parable of grace. So follow along with me, Matthew chapter 20, beginning with verse number 1. Now, I'm, now I may be reading this from just a little bit of a translation from what you're reading. I'm reading from the, from the Holman Christian Standard. So if, it's, if, so if you're different, just, you, you may just need to make just some little adjustments as we go along. But, uh, so I'll just give you that, that heads up. Beginning with verse number 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the workers on one denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And to those men, he said, you also go to my vineyard and I'll give you whatever is right. So off they went. And about noon and at three, he went out again and did the same thing. Then about five he went and found others standing around and said to them, Why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? 
Because no one hired us, they said to him. You also go to, to my vineyard, he told them. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, Call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired, about five came, they each received one denarius. So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more, but they also received a denarius each. When they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These last men put in one hour, and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day and the burning heat. He replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on one denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my business? Are you jealous because I'm generous? So the last will be first. And the first last. You know, one of the things that I've noticed in, in studying the Bible, I've noticed that it, it is important to understand the context of where a passage is. I mean, one of the, one of the things to understand what the Bible is saying at a particular point is, is to understand why it is placed where it's placed. In other words, the context of it. So if it's listed here, then what went before it? Because what goes before it influences what the meaning of that passage is. It's the context of a passage. But with that in mind, this parable, I think, is influenced and is best interpreted when you look at the fuller, wider context of where it is. Now with that in mind, you go back to chapter 19, because there are, actually, there are two stories in chapter 19, and then this one at the beginning of chapter 20. There are three, there are three stories that are connected, that are interconnected. One leads to the other, and, and, and unless you understand, I think, the fuller context of that, of those three stories, you don't really get the full impact of this third story. So, so with that in mind, to go back to chapter 19, begin with verse 16, there is a story. As a matter of fact, it begins a story, and then it's going to be followed by another story, and then you're going to come to what you find in chapter 20. Now, I actually think that the chapter division here, chapter 20, is, is re really unfortunate because it sort of breaks up that. So, so usually when you read this, you just start with chapter 20 with no really idea about what's going on in chapter 19. But beginning with verse number 16 in chapter 19, there is a story. And it's a story that really, actually these three stories can be identified this way. A story of grief, a story of greed, and a story of grace. Think about it. Greed, or, or grief, greed, and grace. So begin with verse 16 of chapter 19, there is a story. And you've heard this story many times. It's a story about a rich young ruler, a rich young man. You've heard that story about this young man comes to Jesus. And he, and he wants to know, Jesus, what can I do? What should I do? What must I do that I can have eternal life? You've heard that story before. I mean, what a grand story it is. But there's several things about that story that make that story, I think, pretty fascinating to me. The first is that he came, he came with the right question because there's not a greater question not a greater question in all the world than the question of what do I need to do in order that I might have eternal life. There is no greater question in life than the question of what lies after this life. You see, it is a fool that goes through this life with no thought about what takes place when you take your final breath. That's a fool. It's a fool that just never looks beyond this life. And so the greatest question of all is the question, what lies beyond this life? What is it? When I close my eyes for the last time in death, what's going to be on the other side? So there's no greater question in life than the question, what can I have? What must I do to, that I might have eternal life? All right? So he asked the right question. Here's something else interesting. Is that he, he came to the right person. He came to Jesus. I mean, if you're going to ask a question about eternal life, who better to come to than the eternal one? The Bible tells us that Jesus was the eternal one. That he was, that in the beginning, 
If you could go back to the beginning, wherever the beginning is, how far ever back that was, if you could go back, 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 all the way to the very beginning, Jesus was already there. So, so the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right? So, so and, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. All right? So Jesus was the Word, and He was already there from the very beginning. So if you're going to ask a question about the eternal, about eternal life, there's no better person than to ask that to than Jesus. Because Jesus stepped out of the eternity and he stepped into our time and space. So he asked the right question. He asked it to the right person. He came at the right time. The Bible says that he was a young man, a young person. That's why we invest in youth groups. That's why we invest in children ministries. That's why it's important that we invest in the next generation. Because I tell you, it's, there's no greater time that a person can come to Jesus than when they are a young person. Because I want to tell you, and some of you, some of you can give a negative testimony to what I'm telling you. I tell you, you can stain yourself as a young person and it will stay with you for the rest of your life. So why do we put emphasis on children? Why do we put, put, we put emphasis on young people? Well, it's because, it's because you can avoid a lot of the baggage that will affect you for the rest of your life. So this young man came at the right time in his life. He came when he was young. So you think about all the things that, he, that, that was good about this story. He came with the right question. He came, he came to the right person. He came at the right time. But what makes this a story of grief, he made the wrong choice. He made the wrong decision. So the Bible tells us that when Jesus told him, told him, you go and you sell all that you have. Now, it wasn't so much that, that it was wrong to have stuff. It wasn't the stuff that disqualified this guy. Because Jesus knew that it wasn't a question of stuff. It was a question of slavery. Because the guy was a slave to his stuff. There's a lot of rich people in the Bible that were faithful followers of Jesus or faithful followers of God. So it's not so much that a wealthy person is disqualified, but Jesus knew that it wasn't that he had what he had in his hands. It's, it was the attitude and the content of his heart. And that's why he told this young man, you go and you sell all that you have because there will be no other master but me. If you're going to be serious about following me, all right, then I see how serious you are. You go and you sell everything, and now you come and you follow me. So what does it mean to follow Jesus then? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Does it mean to, to come to church on Sunday morning? No, I don't think so. Does it mean that, well, that you're baptized, you know, maybe you're eight years old after Bible school? No, I don't think so. What does Jesus say? What does he mean when he says, all right, you go sell everything that you've got, and you come and you follow me? In other words... I'm to be the Lord of your life. There is nothing else, no one else that's calling the shots in your life but me. I take first place in your life. Now, I'll tell you, there's, there's some of us, you know, we go through all of our lives, all of our, men, all, all of our uh, many, many years as, as adults, you know, going to church, going through this and that, without ever really totally putting Christ in the place that He deserves and where He's called us to follow Him as. And that's for Him to be the Lord of our life. So, so the Bible says that he turned away. He was sad because he had a lot of things. All right, so that makes it a story of grief. All right, and that story of grief was followed by another story, a story of greed. Now, it wasn't sort of in-your-face kind of greed. It wasn't obvious greed, but it was subtle greed because right after that, Peter, Peter brings this question up. You know, Peter had, Peter had this unique ability to ask the most inappropriate question at the wrong time. You know what I'm saying? Huh? I mean, that, that takes a gift, doesn't it? Huh? To ask, the, to ask the most inappropriate question at the wrong time. And Peter had that gift. He, he, he was always doing that. And so, so having just witnessed what he just saw and heard with this young man, now Peter, Peter asked Jesus, this interesting question in verse 23. He says, Lord, Lord, you know, we've, we've, we've given up everything to follow you. Now think about it. Yeah, we, we, we gave up our business. We gave up our fishing business. We, we've left our homes. 
We, we've given up everything. You're, you can almost see you can almost see the pride sort of coming up. Well, well, you know, well, you know, we we've sort of left everything. And then Peter asks, "So, so what's in it for us? So what's the bottom line? What are we going to get out of it?" And Jesus exposes that question, as benign as it may sound but he exposed it as a, as a question of greed because that prompts Jesus to now tell a parable. And I'll tell you why these are connected because the last verse of chapter 19, check it out, is the last ver summarizing verse of the parable in verse 16 of chapter 20. It's the same verse. It's the same thing. The last shall be first and the first last. So you know they're connected. So that's what connects them. So what you read in chapter 20 now is the third story in a row. But you see how it's connected? And now this third story is a story of grace. There's a story of grief, greed, and now a story of grace. Now, so here's, so here's basically the story of grace. Jesus tells a parable. Now, a parable is different than an allegory. An allegory is, is, a, is a story in which every detail of that story represents something. All right? Now, Jesus did not tell allegories. As a matter of fact, you can get into a lot of trouble when you take a parable and you try to interpret it as an allegory. But it's not an allegory, it's a parable. But usually a parable usually emphasizes one main truth. One main truth. So, right, so, so let's, let's think about the story that Jesus tells he tells a story about a wealthy landowner. Now, there's a couple of obvious things about this landowner. One is that this landowner has a lot of work to be done, and he has a lot of resources to reward his workers. That's a couple of obvious things that you see from, from this story. So he goes to the marketplace to find workers. Now, the marketplace is where you would go if you're looking for workers. It was sort of like the unemployment pool. It was sort of a hangout. If you were looking for a job, you'd go to the marketplace and sort of just hang out and wait for someone to come that needed a job and they'd hire you. So this landowner goes out. He goes out very early in the morning. Let's say 6 o'clock in the morning. So he goes out and he looks for a group of workers. And so he finds a group and he, and he engages in a conversation with them. And he says, I will pay you one denarii, denarii, one denarius, if you will give me a full day's work. Now, that's not an unusual contract because that was pretty much normal. One denarius for one day's work. All right? That's, and, and that was nothing more than a contract and because in verse 2 it says, after agreeing with the workers on one denarius for the day, he sent them into the vineyard. That's nothing more than a contract agreement. That's a contract agreement. I'll pay you this, you give me this. That's the contract. So at 6 o'clock, he hires a group under contract. You go out, you work, I'll pay you such and such. All right? But here's where it gets interesting. The landowner goes back out at 9 o'clock. But this time, there's no mention of a contract. Because notice he goes out and, and, and the arrangements are different. Now, he doesn't promise anything except if you'll go out and work, I will do what's right. Think about it. So, so, what, so, so, so what's, what's the two elements at play here? Think about this. He says, if you go out and work, I'll do what's right. You go out at work and you trust, what's that? It's faith. And I'll do what's right. That's grace. By the way, how, are your, how, how do you become a Christian? By grace through faith. It's the same two elements. Not of works. It's not coming to church. It's not doing good things. It's not, it's not the works that you do. It's not being a good person. You can't be a good enough person. If you are a Christian, it is because of the grace of God. By your faith. You trust the grace of God. All right? so, so these are the two elements at work here. So he comes and he says, if you'll go out and work, trust me, I'll do what's right. Faith and grace. So 
we send him out at 9 o'clock. He comes back at 12 o'clock. He does the same thing. You go out and work, I'll do what's right. He does the same thing at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And then he did the same thing at 5 o'clock. Just one hour left in the work day. He does the same thing. You go out, you do what's right, you be faithful, you trust me, and I'll do what's right. And then at the end of the day, he has his foreman to line them all up, and he's going to pay them. Now, this is where the fireworks start. If Jesus had just paid those 6 a.m. workers first, they would have taken their denarii and gone their merry way and none of this would have happened. But Jesus paid the last first. And the first last. And so he lines them up and those who worked at 5 o'clock, he gave them a denarii. One hour's work. A denarii. Full denarii. Can you imagine what those six o'clock workers were thinking? Wow. We have worked 12 hours. They work one hour and get a denarii. We're going to get 12 denarius. 12 denarii. We're going to get 12 of those things. But he gives them one as well. Let me just stop right here. Ask you. Do you have a problem with that? Does that seem sort of unfair to you? How many of you think that's sort of unfair? Raise your hand. Come on, come on. You bunch of snobs. You know good and well. You know it's unfair. All right. Here's a couple th- here's a couple problems with this story. Not not from Jesus' point of view, but from mine. One of the problems is this. What businessman would operate like this? Huh? I mean, what businessman would do this? I mean, how could you stay in business if you paid people a full day's wages for one hour? How could you possibly stay in business like that? And then, even if you could manage that somehow, what kind of personnel problems would you create? Huh? I mean, I mean... Labor, labor unions would have a time with this, wouldn't they? So how, how could you... I mean, this is a problem. You, you can't get around this. This is a problem. Here's, here's, another, here's, another, here's another problem. Is it, it just seems unfair. It just seems unfair. I mean, there's no, way, there's no way you can spin this so that it looks good and right. I mean, I, I've heard that some people try to justify this by saying, well, you know, the 6 o'clock crowd, you know, they just a bunch of goof-offs. You know, they didn't work the whole, the whole day. They took long breaks. They took naps during the day. What? The Bible doesn't say that. Well, you know, the, 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 the denarius, the, the, there are different kinds of denarii. I mean, there's gold and there's silver and there's bronze. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. All that just trying to put a good spin on something that you know this seems unfair. Maybe that's the point of the, maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the reason Jesus gave this parable. Is because you can't understand grace. And grace has a way of bringing something out of us. That sometimes makes us very uncomfortable. J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, says... He says, amazing grace has become boring grace. Because we don't think of ourselves as sinners needing amazing grace. Think about that. We've come to a place, haven't we, that we don't really need anything amazing. We're not that bad. We need a little grace. Everybody needs a little grace. But not amazing grace. I mean, not needle, not camel through the eye of a needle kind of grace. We don't need that kind of grace. It's good to have a little grace. We don't really need amazing grace anymore. There's something about grace that brings out 
the negative in us for some reason. Let, let, me, let me share with you just a few thoughts about grace here. The bottom line of grace, three truths. Number one, grace forces me to see my true self. And when I see grace displayed in someone else or by or that God displays it in someone, it reveals sometimes some of the ugly part of my heart, like envy. I get jealous. It seems unfair. It seems unfair that, that God would, would do this for someone and God hasn't done that for me. If this story doesn't seem fair, maybe it's because it exposes an ugly side of, of us. We generally root for the wrong side because we think that we are the six o'clock group. And we think that we are the ones that have worked all of our lives. And we've gone to church. And we've done all the church things. And we've done this for so many years. And it's just not fair that somebody else can just at the end of their life can pray and God give them the same reward that He gives me. It's just not fair. And in our eyes, we work so hard and yet we get so little. And it galls us to see people that we think don't deserve it. And you know, that just leads to grumbling. As a matter of fact, grumbling and, comp and complaining really comes from that from that view of envy. Grumbling comes when I overestimate my worth and I underestimate the grace of God. But let's be honest here. My grumbling really comes from God. It comes, with, comes toward God. I'm just upset with the landowner. Verse 15, you know, Jesus asked that question. He says, he says are you jealous because I'm, ge I'm generous? Jesus, I think, tells the story to teach us something about God. That we tend to look at ourselves as the six o'clock workers. But what Jesus, I think, probably is trying to remind us is that we are the five o'clock workers. I mean, what could they do in one hour? I mean, what really, what value would those five o'clock workers bring to the landowner? Think about it. What, what value could they offer? They only work for one hour. Seriously, what, what really value do you bring to God's kingdom? Seriously. What could you do for God, really? It's my grace that God's called us. Here's, here's another truth about grace. The grace forbids me to expect God to treat me the same way that he treats someone else. The story reminds us to never judge yourself by the way God treats someone else. And this sort of lies at the heart of grumbling, doesn't it? Because we're always looking to others for what they have and how well they have things. And all along we wish that we had it as good or we can't seem to figure out why God has it treated me the same way that someone else seems to get benefited. Just understand this, that God is not bound by our standard of fairness. And if he chooses to bless me, that's his business. If he chooses to bless someone else, that's his business. He's the landowner. You know, the Bible tells us to mourn with those who mourn and to rejoice with those who rejoice. You know what's so difficult about that? It's this issue of, it's this issue of, of envy. I can't really, it's hard. One of the hardest things in life is to rejoice with someone who's, who rejoices. And it's easy, to re, I, I think, to mourn with someone who mourns. But to literally re, rejoice with someone who's rejoicing? Because now you have to step aside from yourself. Because how many times do we, we see somebody get a promotion? They get the promotion that we wanted. Can you really rejoice with them? I mean, something, I mean they, they win the lottery. Can you really rejoice with them? So often it's hard to rejoice with someone who has come along good fortune because of the issue of envy in our own hearts. How come it didn't happen to me? Or what about the fact that, that someone else, they got their prayer answered. God healed them of cancer. It's not fair that God didn't answer my prayer for my loved one. So it's hard to rejoice with someone who got their 
prayers answered because in the back of our hearts and in our minds, grace exposes the envy. Why didn't it happen to me? And here's one other thing about grace. Grace rewards faithfulness and not production. We live in a world that expects production, results, problem solved, revenue generated. And no wonder we've sort of slipped in the, into, into the idea that this is how we please God in church. You know, I think, I think God's point of view is different. The world says, what did you do for God? God says, why did you do it? The world says, what's the bottom line? God says, what did you do for me? The world says, produce results. God says, what's the content of your heart? It all comes down to this, folks. And one of the things that I've learned in my ministry, I, no, 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 let me go back there. One of the things that I am learning in my ministry, I've not completely learned this yet, is this value of grace and how God, how God works individually with us and how I just need to trust Him that He's going to do the right thing. The story ends with a summarizing statement. The last will be first and the first last. So what does that mean? So what does that mean? I think simply this, that in the kingdom of God, when you're talking about things of God, what seems obvious is not always true. What seems fair is not always fair. What seems to be the right thing to do is not always what God would want. I think that's what that means. The last will be first and the first last. What, what seems to be obvious is not always true with God. There's a story about a missionary couple who was returning from serving the Lord for their life in ministry on a foreign, in a foreign place. And as they were returning, they were returning these were the days when they returned and, and did uh, travel by train. And they were returning by train. And as they saw, they gathered closer to the train station. They could see that a huge crowd had gathered. It was a welcome home crowd with banners. Welcome home. We missed you. We love you. Welcome back. Oh, they were so excited. They were so excited to think that someone actually cared, actually thought about the fact that, that they were... They were retiring and coming home from a mission field. And as they got closer to the train station, it became obvious to them that those signs and that crowd was not for them. But it just so happened that President Theodore Roosevelt happened to be on that same train and he was returning from a safari. And so the crowd had gathered to, to celebrate President Roosevelt's return. And after the train had, had emptied, that couple was left. And they walked out of that, onto the platform of the station with the confetti still, on the, still on, the, on the platform. And all the crowds had left. An old missionary man was heartbroken. He told his wife, it's just not fair. It's just not fair. We've served God all of our lives and nobody ever cares, nobody even knows. Nobody cares when we come home. And she looked at her husband and she says, Honey, maybe it's because we're not home yet. We're not home yet. Folks, listen, you can trust God to do the right thing. He'll take care of you. When you serve Him by faith. Put him first in your life. And he'll take care of you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And thank you for the reminder to us of grace. And how important it is to serve you and to trust you. 
and just believe that you will do the right thing by us. Father, help us to rely upon your grace. Father, I pray for every person here today. I don't know where they, where they are in their spiritual walk with you. Father, there may be those who really have really never really entered into a personal relationship with you. They have a church relationship with you, maybe a religious relationship. But they've never really totally followed you as you told that rich young man. Pray for them today, and I pray, Father, that by your grace, your Holy Spirit would convict their heart, and they would respond today in a way that will forever change their life. Father, help us to celebrate your goodness and to trust you, and maybe we just need to rededicate our Christian life. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the invitation for us. In whatever way we need to express that commitment to you, may it be so done now. Father, we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus.